In this section, we're going to be talking about testing the significance of the least squares regression model. So recall that we had a correlation coefficient, which was called rho. In theory, the population co linear correlation coefficient is this value of rho, but of course we estimate it using r. Now there's essentially two types of claims that can be made in regards to two variables being correlated. And that is one that's done on the correlation coefficient, as we see here, and also that being done on the slope of a line, okay, of their regression model. Okay, so we'll discuss both of them. All right, so just like before when we're dealing with hypothesis testing, there's a claim that's made. You can say that two variables are correlated, but in the null hypothesis here, we say that this correlation coefficient is equal to zero. If you recall from two sections ago when we were talking about correlations, correlations that are equal to zero, that referred to there being no linear relationship. Okay, so for the correlation coefficient to be zero, there is zero relationship between these two variables. Okay, and then the alternatives here. Now I do want to discuss each one of these because it could be a little confusing. Okay, especially this first one here. So the correlation coefficient not being equal to zero. What does that mean? Well, if it's non-zero, that means it's either positive or negative, right? So there is some sort of correlation. That's essentially the claim that would be associated with this. So I'll write that in words. Now these next two, where rho is less than zero or rho is greater than zero. Well, in this case, for the left tail test, this is a claim such that there is a negative linear relation. And if you recall from the previous sections, a negative linear relationship has to do with as one variable increases, the other one decreases. And if the correlation is greater than zero, then we say that there is a positive linear relation. Now, equivalently, we can actually test the slope of the best fit line. That's essentially the exact same test. And if you can look at these uh, hypothesis statements here, the slope being zero just means that your line would be zero. That means you have a scatter plot that really you see no signal out of it. Okay, that's what the slope being equal to zero represents. And again, if the slope is non-zero, it just means that it's either it's either going to have a negative slope or a positive slope, right? And of course, when it's less than zero, this will refer to a negative slope, strictly negative. And if the claim was that it's positive, then it would be greater than zero. So something, something like that. So if you have a scatter diagram that exhibits this type of pattern, then you would claim that the relationship is positive linear relation. Okay, so either way, a claim can be either made on their correlation or the slope of the best fit line. Step two, select the significance level. Okay, there, of course, just like usual, we have a significance level that's given to you in the problem. Compute the test statistics. Uh, calculator function in step four will compute this. Okay, now it will actually be a T distribution, believe it or not. And now you wouldn't want to do this by hand. It looks pretty simple just by the looks of it. For the most part, it looks like there's just an R and an N. That's the number of individuals in the sample. But the R, again, if you recall from a couple sections ago, that's a very tedious calculation. So luckily for us, there is a function error calculator that specifically does this. Again, a T distribution has a bell shape just like this. And in order to do this in your calculator, you're going to have to have your explanatory variable as L1 and your response variable Y as L2. Okay. We're going to put that again in those lists. We go to stat, we're going to test, and we're going to look for something called lin reg t test. It's going to ask for your x list, your y list, and you have to choose the direction of your alternative hypothesis. And then we calculate, and the outputs are just like in all the other hypothesis test problems. You got to get a test stat, and you're going to get a p value. Okay, and we want to focus on that p value, right? That's how we're going to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject. There's a little warning right here that I didn't write down. Note that the output says a plus bx. Okay, so in your calculator, it'll say a plus bx. Now, if you recall, the number next to the x is always going to be the slope. So that's how you can remember that. So in this case, it'll be 
B will be the slope and A will be the y-intercept. I believe that's true for all the calculators. But again, you shouldn't memorize if A is the slope and B is the y-intercept or vice versa. You should just be looking at the coefficient next to the x and that will be the slope. Okay, there shouldn't you shouldn't have to do any memorization here other than that. It doesn't matter if it's A, B, whatever is next to the X will be the slope. All right, again, in step five, once we have that P value, you can compare it to the, your uh, significance level and you're gonna be able to reject a null hypothesis or fail to reject it. Again, you want that P value to be small in order to reject a null hypothesis. And of course, step six, we answer the question of interest in the context of the problem as a conclusion statement. All right, it looks like we can get into an example. Example, the Gallup organization regularly surveyed adult Americans regarding their commute time to work and administered a well-being survey. According to the Gallup organization, the Gallup Healthways Well-Being Index composite score is comprised of six indices, life evaluation, emotional health, physical health, healthy behavior, work environment, and basic access. So as you can see here, we have individuals, right? Each one of these rows is an individual. And this particular individual, the first one, uh, only takes five minutes to get to work, and they have a well-being index of 69.2. Uh, just for your information, these well-being indexes or um, other times that you hear the word index um, are usually a score from zero to 100, and this is used a lot in like social sciences to kind of quantify something that's hard to quantify. For example, like well-being, how do you quantify that? Well, they come up with some sort of way to do that. They have like a mix of, in this particular case, your life evaluation, emotional health, physical health, healthy behavior, work environment, basic access. They evaluate these types of variables and in some sort of way they, they average them out to come up with this well-being index. So in essence, the higher your well-being index score, the more well off you are. These aren't perfect sciences, but they do the best they can, especially in the social sciences where it's hard to quantify things. Now, as I can see here, just by inspecting this, um, as the commute time increases, it looks like their well being scores start to decrease. Okay. Now, this is a pretty small sample. It was for this example, it was probably cherry picked just to make a, just to make a point. And you can see uh, this person almost takes two hours to get to work and they have a, a lower score than the person that only takes five minutes. But again, does your time to commute to work, is that alone gonna determine your well-being? No, but it contributes something to it, okay? So we wanna see what the relationship is, whether it's a positive linear relationship or negative linear relationship or none at all, really. The data in the table are based on the results of the survey. Which variable is the explanatory variable and which is the response variable? Okay, so oftentimes if they don't give you which one is the explanatory variable, again, that's your X value, and your response is your output variable, right? Your Y value. Sometimes either one can be the explanatory and the other one can be the response. And in some cases, it doesn't make sense for one to be the response and the other to be explanatory. So we kind of want to see if one makes more sense than the other, okay? Now, your commute time, that really just is based off of how far you are living from work, right? And then your well-being score is composed of all these other things, right? Emotional health, physical health, healthy behavior, and so forth. Okay. Does it make sense that, I guess I can ask you this, what makes more sense? Would the time it takes you to get to work have more effect on your well-being than... Well, if you already have your well-being established, would that affect the time it takes for you to get to work? Like that second one, the latter one, doesn't really make sense, right? Depending on your well-being score, it doesn't. It shouldn't affect how long it takes you to commute to, to work, right? So I would say that the commute time should be the explanatory variable, and then your well-being will respond to that commute time. Okay. Um, now we're going to draw a scatter diagram using your calculator and then roughly sketch, sketch a graph. Um, so I'll just put your x values in L1, your y values in L2, right? This is your x value, these are going to be your y values. And we'll show it on the calculator first and then roughly sketch a graph. Okay, here we are at the blank home screen. Let's go to step, edit, go ahead and clear out these lists here. And 
Let's go ahead and start typing away. Okay, uh, now that we have the list in there and you double check your inputs, let's go ahead and quit out of this. And of course, if you haven't changed anything from the last sections, you should already have the setup for the scanner plot. But let me just kind of go through that again. Second stat plot. Make sure all the other plots are turned off. Um, we just have plot one turned on. And the type, of course, it has to be the scatter plot. Make sure that's highlighted. And then it's going to ask for X and Y list. Mine are in L1, L2, so I'm good to go. Let's go ahead and quit out of this. I'm going to press zoom which is that middle button at the top row. Go all the way to the ninth option or just press the number nine. Zoom stat. And as you can see, um, even if you press trace here, you can see how that X is five and Y is 69.2. And you can just press to the right and it'll show you all the values as, they, as your in X increases, your Y values actually go down, right? From left to right. So it looks so far to be a negative relationship, right? Um, we ha there hasn't been a claim that I've read so far. I think that's in part C here. So let's go ahead and uh, sketch this first. Yeah, when you're sketching these, you want to use the scope of your data in order to not have so much blank space in your graph. So for example, uh, your lowest value of x is 5 and your highest is 105. I, I feel like 0 to 100 would be fine for that. And then just kind of back it off a little bit. All right. And then for the Y values, I would say that, uh, well, your lowest is 63.9 and your highest is 69.2. So maybe just having, I don't know, maybe like 62 to 70 would be pretty good. I can call this 62 down here, and this is 70. Okay, this is like a zoomed in view of our data. Okay, so that roughly looks like what we had on our calculator. Let me actually do a side by side really quick. Okay, so that's, that's roughly the same. Okay. I'm happy with that. All right, in part C, let's go ahead and read that. Determine the linear correlation coefficient. Okay, that's that R value. And test the claim that there is a linear correlation between the two variables at a 5% significance level. Okay, so they didn't really specify whether it's a negative correlation or a positive. They're just saying, test the claim that there is a linear correlation between the two variables, between your commute time and well-being index. That's a claim statement. Okay, so let's just go ahead and start with where we always start. Step one, hypothesis statements. We are talking about what type of parameter. We're not talking about a mean, a proportion, standard deviation, or anything like that. We're talking about the correlation, right? That's that P-looking value. It's, it's a Greek letter. It looks like a P to us, but the Greek that's a Greek letter row. Okay, it's always that it's equal to zero. Again, it's I would actually write in the words no linear relation. And the claim statement was that, that there is a linear relationship, right? So the row is not equal to zero means it is not not correlated, if you think of it like that. There is no zero correlation, which means it's either positive or negative, so there's either a negative correlation or a positive correlation. That's the way you can think of it. I know it's a little weird to think of it that way, but that's what that is. There is a linear relation. And that one is actually our claim statement. It's good to identify that because that helps us out when we're coming up with our conclusion statement in step six. Step two is our significance level. I believe they told us it was a 5% significance level. Yep. Step three, let's go ahead and use the space down here. We're gonna come up with our test statistic. Now it turns out it's gonna be a t-test for these types of problems. And we're gonna be using the function called lin reg, linear regression, t-test. Okay, it's gonna give us a t-value, that's our test stat. And it's also gonna give us 
a p-value for step four, which I'll draw right here. Okay, and as long as you have your data in the list still, x is in L1, y is in L2, then we can actually produce this. Let's go back to the calculator. Okay, so you should have all that data in the list. As you can see, it's there. Let's go ahead and quit out. And let's go to stat. We're going to go to test. We're going to go all the way down. Actually, if we just go up, it's probably easier. Go up and look for Linreg t-test. Select that. X list is in L1. Y list is in L2. Keep the frequency as 1. And you can see how in this next step for the alternative, um, either way, whether the slope, which is that beta right there, or the rho, which is that correlation coefficient, um, it can it could be tested using this. Okay, it's the exact same test no matter what the claim is. It's either on a slope or a correlation coefficient. And in our case, the alternative was that it's not equal to zero. You can't see that right now, but that's what that was. And let's go ahead and calculate. Okay. Again, from the very top, if you were looking for a best fit line for this, at the very top we see that there's an A plus BX. So you should clearly know that the slope must be the B, right? Because it's next to the X. Okay, so now they're not really asking for that. I'll actually write out linear regression model just for kicks here. The test has 11, negative 11.16 if you round. Uh, that's a pretty large T value. You can think of that as 11 dis standard deviations away, which is pretty far off. And the p-value here is pretty small, 1 times 10 to the negative 4. It's in scientific notation. Okay, And your y-intercept is 69.03 when rounded. And your slope is negative 0 0.05 if you're rounding to two decimal places. And again, that, that slope can be interpreted as for every one minute increase in your commute time, your well-being index goes down by 0.05. Points. All right, so step four, we're going to draw a graph. This is a t-test, so it has to have a bell shape. The p-value here if from the output was 1.01 times 10 to the negative 4. And what type of tail test is this? Well, according to the alternative here, we have a not equal to, so it was a two-tail test. And the test stat here was a negative 11.16. And because of the symmetry, we also have a positive 11.16. And the Area in those two tails is the p-value. Okay, that's a step four. Step five, we make our decision. The decision is made by comparing your p-value to your significance level, which in our case, the significance level was 0 0.05, the p-value being 1.01 .01 times 10 to the negative four, which is definitely less, so we're going to go ahead and reject the null hypothesis because we're essentially saying that there's a small chance of us being wrong in a decision to reject the null hypothesis, so we're going to go ahead and take that chance. Six is going to be our conclusion statement. Now, the alternative was the claim, so you're going to have in that claim statement the word support. Okay, so we're going to say, uh, since we were able to reject the null hypothesis, that means the alternative is, in a sense, true. So our data does support the claim. Okay, uh, I'll go to that flowchart just so you can see that that does line up with what I just logic my way through. Okay, so in our case, the alternative was the claim. So we're going in this direction. Were we able to reject the null hypothesis? Yes. So the sample data supports the claim that, and then we just restate the original claim. And what was that claim statement? Well, it was that there is a linear correlation between the two variables. What were those variables? Commute time and well-being index. Now in the last section, we talked about regression models, right? Least squares regression models. And I did mention something about whether the regression model is useful or not, okay? and. To determine whether it's useful or not, we have to see if there's a linear correlation, right? So we have to run some sort of test, uh, like we just showed in this example. Okay, if there seems to be a linear correlation, then we can actually use that best fit line, which we have here, to make predictions. Otherwise, you can't use this model. 
to make accurate predictions. So that is the condition in order to use this model to make predictions that we have to run this linreg t test to see if there is a linear correlation between the two variables. Okay, so let's discuss that. So using the regression equation for predictions, let's just run through these uh, four points here. Uh, use a regression equation for predictions only if the graph of the regression line on the scatter plot confirms that the regression line fits the points reasonably well. Okay, so you do want to always perform some sort of scatter plot in real life. Okay, you always want to see how your data looks. And then use a regression equation for predictions only if the linear correlation coefficient r indicates that there is a linear correlation between the two variables. How do you do that? Using lin reg t test. Okay, we're going to be looking at the p value for that. Three, use a regression line for predictions only if the data do not go much beyond the scope of the available sample data. Predicting too far beyond the scope of the available sample data is called extrapolation, and it can result into bad predictions. Okay, so for example there, I guess I can just draw a small little example off to the side here. If you have data right around here, and you fit your best fit line through there. Now, your, this bef, best fit line really only is useful for this window, okay? Because that's where the data exists, right? Anything far to the left and far to the right, you don't know if this line, this best fit line, actually still can exhibits this linear fashion. It might actually, it might actually go something like this and like this. You actually have no idea, okay? So to make predictions for values outside of this window is risky, okay? It can actually result into very bad predictions. So that's called extrapolation. What we want to do is only use this model for predicting values within the scope of the data. So for anything like right here, you can see how this will predict that y value. This x value will be predict that y value, and so on, OK? So anything be beyond the scope of this data is is risky right that would be considered extrapolation and it's not the best practices for using these linear regression models uh, if the regression equation does not appear to be useful for making predictions okay, how do we determine that again using linreg t test the best predicted value of the variable is just the sample mean okay so what do i mean by that okay um well, i guess i can explain it down here okay so in this flow chart it says yeah, if we determine that the regression model is good, then yeah, we can use this equation to make predictions. However, if we don't find that the regression model is a good model, again, using Linreg t-tests, then we can only use the average of the y values. Okay, so for example, something that would not pass the Linreg t-test would be a scatter diagram that probably looks like this. Okay, where no matter what your x value is, it results in about the same y value. You see that? So the best fit line would be essentially a horizontal line. Okay. Again, the best fit line always goes to the point x bar, y bar. So what would x bar be? Probably around here. Y bar would be here. So no matter what x value we have, the best prediction for y would be just y bar, no matter what. Right, you see that? No matter what x value we have, the best prediction is just going to be y bar. So that's why we use y bar when there's no correlation between two values because x and y have nothing to do with each other. So your best prediction for y is just considering the average of y and disregarding anything to do with x. All right, so in this example here, it's asking us to predict the height of a person whose shoe size is 29 centimeters. Okay, so um, what you'll notice here from previous example when we dealt with height and shoe size that they're switched around, your x and the y is here. Uh, because in both cases, either one can be the response variable and the other one can also be the predictor variable. So just by looking at the data here, we have one individual, everything's measured in centimeters in this case. And we only really have five individuals here. And if you were to actually run this data through your calculator, right, where we have L1 here, L2, right, these are your X values, these are your Y values. So let me actually go ahead and put that data into the calculator. That way we can see the P value from this t-test.
Okay, so I've already put in the data into my calculator here. I'm gonna go ahead and back out of this. Second so quit. Go to SAT, go to test, go to Linrec T test by going up. Enter. We're just gonna keep the alternative as not equal to zero. That just means that there's a linear correlation. Where regardless of that, it's positive or negative. And let's go ahead and calculate. And the p-value comes out to be 0.294, if I'm rounding. Okay, so that's a pretty large p-value. Okay, it's you can think of that as uh, if we reject the null hypothesis, if we reject that there is no lo no correlation, there's a 29% chance that we'd be wrong in that decision. So we're not going to take that chance. Okay, so what does that mean for us? Well, if we're not going to reject the null hypothesis, okay, even though it created a best fit line. Well, it's not useful because our p-value was 0.294. And that means we cannot use this not useful for prediction, okay? It's only useful if it passes this test, okay? And as you can see, just from the scatter diagram, that line doesn't fit the data too well, right? Um, there seems to be a couple of data values that deviate a lot from that line. And that's probably what contributes to this line not fitting the data too well. Okay, so our best guess at somebody's height, given their shoe size, well, if their shoe size and height have nothing to do with, any, with each other anymore, right, because this model is not useful, then our best guess at somebody's height is just literally the average height of all these five individuals, right? If you were to actually average out these heights, you would actually get 177.3. You can try that out. Okay, so 177.3, it looks like it's about probably here. So this is, would be the more accurate model. No matter what your shoe size is, that is the predicted value. Okay, because the data doesn't fit this line too well. Okay. Now we know from previous examples that your shoe size and your height do have some sort of positive correlation, right? It's not perfect. Sometimes shorter people have bigger shoe sizes than people that are tall. I know that can be the case. But on average, your shoe size does tend to go up as your height goes up and vice versa. So if you did suspect that there was a correlation, then usually just by adding more data, randomly, of course, you can actually um, substantiate that better, okay? Uh, what, what can also happen is that it becomes more scattered, right? And then you can substantiate that that's not correlated, right? That can be the case too. But in this particular case, we have 40 pairs of shoe lengths and heights. And when the test was done here, I don't have the list of data on me, but when the test was done here, the p-value came out to be very small, which means we're rejecting the fact that they're not related. So they are considered correlated here. Okay, And the model actually is more updated with new slope and y-intercept. Now this model will be used for predictions. Okay, Again, that only can be used for predictions when the p-value is small enough. That's going to be useful for predictions. Okay, so for example, giving somebody who has a shoe length of 29 centimeters, you would just plug in 29 into this model, right? And we, you would produce a height of 174.3. What do I mean by that? Well, just by looking at the graph here, 29 seems to go, well, here's 28, here's 30, here's 29. So we're going to go up to the model, look over to the left. If I do this correctly, that should be close to 174. That's roughly good. 174.3. Okay. So again, that's what the usefulness of this model is. If the data does fit the model nicely, then you can actually use this model to predict other values. Okay, and they're all going to be along this line. Okay, that's it for this chapter. Thanks for watching.